welcome back to another episode of Continuum Meditations Discusses. In this episode, we will be discussing the last two episodes of the Exorcist TV series. The first one from two weeks ago entitled Safe as Houses. The second one from this past Friday entitled Unclean. And as always, there will be spoilers weaved throughout this review slash analysis of both the first and second seasons of the program. And so if you don't want to be spoiled, I'm going to give you fair warning at this point that I will be talking about different plot points that I found salient. But if you don't want to be spoiled, I will give you fair warning. Please do feel free to turn this analysis off until you've had an opportunity to review The Exorcist for yourself. So, let's, with that being said, let's get to it. I want to start off uh, with uh, Safest Houses, as I said. And we start off at the Vatican in Rome with Father Devin Bennett, whom we've seen from last season, and a new uh, individual, a Cardinal Caro, C-A-R-O, who is now, as we are seeing, uh, has become Bennett's ally in the fight against the conspiracy that has threatened to try to overthrow the Catholic Church. Now, as we start this particular scene, we see Father Bennett reviewing the dossiers, uh, dossiers that he has in fact put together of Maria Walters, Brother Simon, and uh, that looks like that's about it, but we know from our analysis that he is reviewing other information that is related to the whole conspiracy that is going on against the Catholic Church. But anyway, we also know that Cardinal Guillaume is part of this conspiracy. We also know that there are others who are part of this conspiracy from business, industry, finance, academia, religion, all sectors of human society and civilization. Father Bennett is trying to expose the conspiracy there to the College of Cardinals. There is a test that is performed on Cardinal Guillaume uh, to, to try to see if he is in fact demonically possessed. That test fails. It's a test of holy water, and Cardinal Guillaume is not shown to be possessed, and so he is allowed to leave. We move on from there to see Marcus and Tomas still arguing about Tomas becoming psychically connected to a demon. And Marcus is continually trying to warn Tomas that this could be a trick. Tomas does not accept this judgment. He does not accept Marcus's superior wisdom and experience in this regard, and in fact goes on to say that Marcus is jealous of his abilities because he believes, that is, Tomas believes, that this is a gift from God. It's the same gift he believes that led him to Marcus in the first place. He does not understand why Marcus does not appreciate it. And so instead, he's now going on to denigrate Marcus and say, you are jealous of me and my abilities because of this gift that I have been given by God. At least he thinks it's been given by God. The question is, of course, is it a gift from God or is it something that actually the satanic brotherhood, that is the fallen angels, the demons are doing or have given to Tomas to try to mislead him. And this was actually something that Marcus himself had raised with Tomas in the very first episodes of season one of the exorcist. So we have seen that this is not something that is new between these two guys. Uh, it's not something that is just now being considered as a possible detriment to their work. It's something that has been going on, but now it's going further and further as we see these two continuing to try to get along together and to do this job together. We find out as we get back to the foster home in Seattle, that Caleb was led to a water well by Verity. And he goes on to say, uh, to tell Andy, that is the foster father, and Andrew Kim, that he was led to the water well and left there by Verity. Okay, and that as we find out later on, he actually claims that she took his hand and he heard her voice as they were led to, as she, as she led him to the water well and told him to stand on the well and count to ten uh, and, and that she just left him there. And of course, when Andrew confronted Verity about this entire issue, she vehemently denied this, absolutely said it was untrue, and questioned why Caleb would lie like that. Well, I think it's pretty obvious here. Neither one of them is lying. They both have been misled. 
Uh, in this case, though, it is Caleb who I believe, anyway, firmly was misled by the demonic entity that is at the household, that is now infesting the household, that is now making its presence more known and more felt, to try to undermine everything that is going on in the house, and it's taking its toll on the family as a whole. It was the one, I believe, anyway, that led Caleb using Verity's voice and making Caleb think that he felt her touching him, that is, leading him by the hand to the water well and having him stand on it. Uh, we see in another scene that Cardinal Caro tells uh, Father Bennett that there are dozens of exorcists who have been recalled to Rome and have been reassigned to tasks unbefitting their talents, as the Cardinal says to uh, Bennett. Furthermore, he tells uh, Father Bennett that there have been no exorcisms approved in the last six months by the Vatican. And then he goes on to give Bennett an ally to find in the form of a woman whose picture we see him given by the Cardinal. And so we move on from there to what is happening in the episode Unclean. So as we move on into the episode Unclean, we open once again with a very powerful scene. We are yeah, This time we're in France, and uh, we are watching the application of the Vocare Polveri ritual, the ceremony of ash that we saw in season one. Now this is an awesome tie-in. The ceremony of ash, or Vocare Polveri, is a demon summoning ritual which these demoniacs use to summon spirit beings from their dimension of existence into our own corporeal realm of existence and the means by which this is done is through human sacrifice it requires people to be killed it requires their body parts to be used in the ceremony and it requires those body body parts to be burned to to dust to ash and then used in the ceremony to summon these demons from their realm into ours so we see that it is cardinal guillon once again who is leading this ritual this time unlike in the first season where it was brother simon the now deceased brother simon who led the ceremony of ash during that particular time frame and we see that a, a woman is creating these um, these almond tarts for them which she is using uh, the uh, the wafers for the Eucharist which represent the body of Christ to sprinkle on top of these almond tarts uh, to make them look like she's she's pulverizing them to a very fine grainy material to make them look like sugar and she's putting them on top of these almond tarts. This is this is a wonderful uh, little move by her. I mean, I really loved how this was done. And what happens is, of course, that as these men begin to eat these almond tarts, they are poisoned and they are assassinated. They die. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you. <laughs> Every time I'm watching that scene, I just love it. I mean, it just yeah, I just go to pieces watching it. How she assassinates these guys and kills them with this so simple a means. Uh, and the reason that it works, of course, is because these men are demonized men. They are demoniacs. They have been possessed by demons. And so these these wafers, which represent the body of Christ, are literally poison to them in that sense that they have been destroyed by uh, the, the, the holy incarnation of Christ within these wafers. Catholic doctrine actually say, suggests, and I don't know if all Catholics believe this, but I know that there are those who do. Catholic uh, doctrine suggests that this, the, when these wafers are consumed by the believer, they are literally transformed into the body of Christ as you ingest them. Now, as the scene closes, we watch Mouse set these men on fire with a candle uh, that is uh, situated at the table where they are all eating. And then we watch her leave, and as she leaves, she uh, recites the Latin phrase, Igne natura renovatur integra. And this statement basically means, by fire, nature is restored in purity, or it might also mean, pure matter is restored by spirit. This is a basic way of saying that nature declares the existence of God and his love and perfection for all of creation. Psalm 19, 1 talks about the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. If you look at what Mouse said when she made that statement of igne natura renovatur integra, you actually see that that is the 
the words that many people put up on the cross and associated with the idea of inri, I-N-R-I. At a more esoteric level, mouse saying this is something that a lot of these secret societies use as a means to talk about the notion that a man can become more like God by freeing himself not only of the limitations of matter, if you will, but of the limitations of consciousness as circumscribed and limited by matter. In listening to Mouse, it made me wonder if her quote and her actions suggest that she is an agent or, an repre or a representative of such groups, of such secret societies or orders acting against these people who are engaged in this conspiracy. Now, I don't know this for certain, but is she a Rosicrucian or a member of the Order of the Rose Cross? Is she a Freemason? Is she a Knight Templar? I don't know. We don't have enough information yet, but I thought I found it interesting that she would make such a quote and I found it interesting the connections that were made there. So I thought I would bring that up in the course of what was going on. Okay, so let's get back to Shelby for a minute. He has a lot of faith and in what he believes in. But in my opinion, he has very little knowledge of how to correctly and effectively apply what he knows in dealing with the unseen world. He smears this lamb's blood on the front door, mimicking the whole idea of the Jewish Passover ritual uh, that is uh, described in Exodus 12, but he doesn't apply it correctly. It doesn't stop any of the actions that are taking place. He then, when he is on the bridge and he hears those whispers, he shouts and says, I have a Bible, but he doesn't seem to really know how to wield it like the spiritual weapon that it is supposed to be. He, he, he seems to understand the notion of the shield of faith, which is the defensive part of it, but he does not, at least yet anyway, appear to understand the sword part of it, which is the offensive part of faith, which is taking up the sword of the spirit, which the Bible tells is the word of God itself, right? Uh, the, 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 the mind of God, the revelation of God. And so he does not effectively wield this weapon against his spiritual adversary, which he firmly believes is there, he, but he does not know how to deal with it. So in this sense, he does not possess the kind of skills that Marcus perhaps would possess, or Tomas perhaps would, would, would possess. Some, someone who is trained, someone who has been educated in these ideas, and someone who is able to effectively wield them to a greater degree than just a neophyte would, but who does not have any deep level of understanding. Now, I'm not saying his faith is inadequate. Certainly, that's fine. Faith is fine. Faith is good. But uh, in this sense, Shelby is not going to be an effective warrior by himself if he is left to his own devices against this enemy, because he does not know how to correctly and effectively apply his faith to this particular adversary. In other words, he's way out of his element, he's way in over his head, he is way out of his league, and he needs some help. So the bulk of this, this episode is actually dealing with Marcus and Tomas going to exercise a young girl in Seattle, Washington, whom they have been referred to by a deacon that knows Marcus personally in some diocese in, I, I don't know if it's in Seattle or if it's somewhere else, but anyway, this is the, the lion's share of what this episode is about. And from my own personal standpoint, I quite frankly began to realize very early on that this kid was not possessed at all. And the more and more evidence we saw, the more and more evidence we actually observed that it was this crazy, abusive mom of hers that was really taking advantage of the situation and had done all these things to her. This young girl, Harper Graham, has been drugged uh, who knows how long in her life. She has been psychologically manipulated. There is no supernatural presence in their house. There's no supernatural presence in, their do in her daughter. There's nothing going on except this crazy mom who needs to be institutionalized and her daughter kept the heck away from her or gotten the heck away from her as soon as possible post haste. The lesson here, however, is good for Marcus, or should I say it's good for Tomas, 
in that it teaches Tomas humility and it teaches him not to jump the gun with respect to, to dealing with this kind of phenomenon. It teaches him to work in the, uh, in the methods that Marcus is trying to teach him to establish the train of evidence and to look for the actual signs and not just follow what his heart tells him or what he thinks his so-called visions are telling him because especially now that he has interacted directly with one of these supernatural beings his vision could be tainted. It could be skewed to show him that is Tomas exactly what he wants to see or what he thinks he's seeing, but maybe, maybe even further what some demonic entity wants him to see in order to mislead him. Now, we get back to uh, Father Bennett and Mouse uh, in Belgium this time. Bennett meets Mouse inside a church in Antwerp and they decide to test one another with the sacrament, that is with the Eucharist uh, in, during communion. And it's, this is the same thing that killed the demoniacs in scene one. It's a representation of the body of Christ. So we find that Mouse has been watching Father Bennett for at least three days. She's observed that he has not taken communion in all that time. And so she decides to find out whether or not he is actually one of the possessed, one of the integrated or not. And she tells him, you're going to take this and I'm going to see what you are. Or she pulls out a knife <laughs> or there's an alternative, the Eucharist or the knife, the Eucharist or the knife. OK, so anyway, and so as both Bennett and Mouse take the communion, they begin to see that neither one of them is the enemy. That is, neither one of them are actually possessed beings. And so they begin to try to start working together to see if they can unmask and uproot this conspiracy and restore order and goodness to the world. Well, that kind of concludes that until we get to the very end of this of the show where we see that Mouse is taking Bennett to meet her source, as she calls her, that is, the person who we find out is a she, one named Sister Dolores Navarro, who is, in fact, a professional exorcist herself. But as we begin to see, unfortunately, as Bennett comes to learn, Sister Navarro is possessed. And this is when Mouse reveals to him that they are not calling these exorcists home to Rome in order to murder them. They could do that anywhere in the world, I guess, if you really wanted to. They are actually calling these exorcists home in order to have them become possessed themselves. And we see that, unfortunately, this Sister Dolores Navarro has become one of the victims of the conspiracy in that regard. And so we're going to find out more, I hope anyway, in the next episode as to what is going on. Uh, however, to get back to Marcus and Tomas, the circumstances that uh, allow them to meet up with the family, the foster family that we've come to know in the first three episodes, culminate with Rose, the social worker, meeting at the Graham home there in Seattle where she is checking up on the young girl Harper. And in the course of these precipitating events, she encounters Marcus and Tomas. And eventually, some of the things that she says to Marcus actually help provoke his suspicions even further that they are not dealing with anything supernatural in this, in this matter, in the Graham home. They are dealing entirely with natural events, natural concerns that are the province more of psychology and perhaps the law than anything to do with the priesthood and with uh, professional exorcists. I think that the thing that most interests me right now is not just what is happening at the foster home, but also what is happening more overall with the conspiracy. I am wondering if we're going to see the return of Maria Walters this year. Will we see other more important members of the conspiracy? Will we see them on a more international scale? This is going to be very interesting to see how vast and how deep and how, how wide ranging, how dispersed this conspiracy really is, how powerful it is, not only in terms of its human and natural networks, but how powerful it is in terms of the fallen angel a hierarchy, if you will. If you recall from last year, Pazuzu was running his own game against the Rand's family, but at some point he decided to get in on the conspiracy against the Catholic Church and throw in his two cents about how that was going to go. He didn't get very much of an opportunity to deal with that uh, because he was exorcised from the Rance family and put out to pasture, as it were. Uh, so we didn't uh, see him become more involved in that part of the, anything. 
but it will be interesting to see if we're going to have any group of powerful demons this year and to see what kind of actions they may decide to get up to. So with that being said, folks, I will leave you till next time. Bye for now.